Ah, thanks for streaming in. We thank our next guest for doing just that as well. Uh, you read all his writings at The Ringer, and you should catch his podcast with Jill Capadia, the Philly special, loyal to his Philly roots. Benjamin Solak jumps on with us here on Birds 365. Right, here's where I want to start with you, Ben. Mm-hmm. Which surprised you more this year? Two play, Two individuals who grew exponentially this season as compared to where they were at in their careers uh, 13 months ago when, after the season seasonal ending loss to Tampa Bay. The rise of Nick Sirianni in the ranks of head coaches in the National Football League or the rise of Jalen Hurts in the quarterback ranks in the National Football League? Which surprised you more? I think Hurts was more surprising. Uh, you know, we like to say when we talk about player development that the development's not linear. He, a reminder that usually guys don't just get progressively better year over year. The exception that proves the rule is Jalen hurts. <laughs> I remember saying at times yeah. last off season, yeah. like, yeah, he's gotten better in s- the last six off seasons, but you can't do that in a seventh off season. Nobody does this. Nobody just keeps getting better and getting better and getting better. And, and the, a, the precision with, with which he improves on the stuff he's bad at is really impressive. Uh, the way that he doesn't have many drop-offs in the stuff that he's already improved on, right? He rarely regresses. He rarely steps back. Like, it's just one of one. You just don't see guys, like, even among the dudes who have, like, the legendary work ethic. He's among the guys who love the game and were always slight and were always doubted. Like, you don't see this. You don't see guys get this much better year over year through the college ranks and into the NFL ranks. Sirianni, like we're not good at figuring out who good head coaches are. Like we, like the league isn't, we aren't like, nobody's good at this. When a guy is just like super uh, suddenly like has a, has a great season. It's only so surprising because in general, we're just really bad at figuring out who the good head coaches are. <laughs> we're, we're, we're kind of good yeah. at figuring out who the good quarterbacks are. And Hertz continues to prove us. Those of us who, those who doubted him, which was me, uh, continues to prove us wrong. You know, I, I've been talking about that, Ben. It's interesting that you bring that up. You know, mm-hmm. coaching is probably, Like, I know you've done a lot of quarterback evaluation over the years. Coaching is probably the last bastion of the NFL where we don't have, like, a lot of information on these guys. So Mm -hmm. it's really hard to judge. It's hard enough to judge quarterbacks or any other position. But with coaches, you know, I've I've been doing this for a long time, and people ask me, well, is that a good decision? Is that a good decision? I'm pretty honest. I have no stinking idea. Because I right. have, I, there's no, there's no tangible information to really gather other than, you know, numbers. And and we use Philadelphia as an example because so much of the fan base can't stand Jonathan Gannon, but number two defense, seventy sacks, all the turnovers, blah blah blah, and that's not good enough. Is it personnel? Is it coaching? Who's responsible? It is. An, it's an interesting conundrum. And now that the Eagles are looking for a defensive coordinator and you see some college names and, you know, what are they doing? My answer is I can't tell you. <laughs> yeah. If I'm if I'm reading between the lines, I'm guessing they want to become more aggressive and they want to have better plans against elite quarterbacks. Right. Uh, Gannon was a, a lineup and play defensive coordinator he wasn't his first year when they were kind of running all the old Colt stuff all the Matt Eberflus stuff and then he wasn't his second year when Vic Fangio came in and they started running more Fangio stuff like schematically they changed from year one to year two a lot you go back and watch that year one film there's no you know odd fronts with a nose tackle they know Jordan Davis no Limbaugh Joseph they only had four down fronts that's all they had they were only running cover two they know this quarter stuff like all like they they schematically changed a lot like Gannon has now like for two years in Philadelphia brought in a, a, a new defense, brought in like new ideas, installed them very quickly and got the team to execute them. That's good coaching. Like he's a good teacher. I know, make no bones about it. I'm positive he is, but he's a lineup and play guy. And put, put him out on the field and then let's have our 11 be better than your 11. And that sounds great until one of their 11 is Patrick Mahomes. And then you start saying, okay, we can't do this anymore. We need to create something. You need to generate something. There needs to be chaos. There needs to be an attack. There needs to be confusion. There needs to be movement, something to stress this guy out. And when you look at Vance Joseph, who's, who's known as a blitzer in the NFL level, Jim Leonard, who's known as, as a blitzer and a picture changer at the college level, I think they understand that that they have the personnel such that they're always going to be able to beat the bad quarterbacks. They're always going to be able to stop the bad offenses. It's beating the good offenses and the great quarterbacks where you need to do things schematically. You need to put pressure on them, and that's what they're looking for in a new D.C. 
That's why they blitzed more in the Super Bowl than they had all year long. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, I said earlier that would be idiotic because Mahomes is the best at handling the blitz in the NFL. But if you get to a point where you think the only answer is chaos, we got to do something that no one is expecting. Well, they did, and it didn't work. Uh, but uh, I digress. Um, interesting point you made about the change from year one of year two to the Gannon uh, of the Gannon era here in town. It was in part predicated by the Jordan Davis draft, or was it? Had they already made the decision that we want to go more Fangio-like than we did in year number one, and we want to have the guy just on the nose and have everything build out from that, or was it they got Davis, they liked Davis as much as they did, said, well, this is going to necessitate us changing the defense. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? I'm guessing the the decision to change some stuff up schematically came first just because Davis isn't the sort of player who like, oh, well, you want to play him as a nose tackle, but you could play him as like a, a, a pass rushing defense tackle if you wanted to. No, he's just this, right? If, if they, if Roseman took Davis without knowing that the defense was going to need a player like Davis, that's very aggressive and then kind of unnecessary, right? That I, I'd be surprised if they didn't already start to lean that direction and saying, all right, we need a guy who can play the true nose. And you could also make an argument that Gannon wanted to play that sort of a defensive line, that sort of a defensive front yeah, in year one and did. just didn't have the guy, right? Like occasionally they put Hargrave the there. No, right. But yeah, even when Hargrave plays the nose, he's not playing it to like take away two bodies, take away two gaps, yeah. make the numbers in the running game. Hargrave's playing it to penetrate. Hargrave's playing it to cause problems. So this is like a different philosophy. Um, So I'm going to guess schematically they, they had that approach. And like, Hassan Reddick fits into that approach because he's an outside linebacker. Chauncey Gardner-Johnson fits into that approach because he's a, a safe dude can rotate down and play over the slot. Like, all of that is indicative of the fact that they knew they were going to make the change. That's why, you know, the other thing you see about Vance Joseph and about Jim Leonard is that they have backgrounds of running 3-4 defense, right? They're going to stay in a structure where they're going to be capable of putting, you know, three down front and a five down front are functionally the same thing. They're going to be able to put an odd number front on the field on early downs, stop the runs. So that way they can get into third and long, put the four down front of the field, rush pass it. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause I've actually talked to JG about that band and, you mm -hmm. know, he wanted to play this defense, the Fangio defense from the day he got here. You know, it's interesting because when they hired Gannon, I thought, well, we're going to see a bunch of Zimmer stuff and, and yeah, we too. didn't see a bunch of Zimmer stuff. And then I saw, well, we're going to see a bunch of Everflu stuff. And he didn't want to play that either. And in some ways, I give him credit. He and Brandon Staley are very close. And that's sort of, you know, more than anything else where it comes from. They both believe in playing that same scheme. And that's why Jordan Davis and Hassan Reddick. Remember, last year it was Javon Hargrave, great player, but he can't play nose. Mm -hmm. um, and Gennard Avery playing in the in the Hassan Reddick role. So that's not going to work out. So he had to do some different things. And then Howie Roseman was able to get the personnel. So that brings me to my next question, Ben. You got these guys who are perfect bits in theory for this scheme. And all of a sudden you want to change the scheme again, or is this more window dressing? And it's probably going to be Sean Desai or Denard Wilson. And I, I, I was talking to a personnel guy yesterday and he framed it as, look, you talk to all these guys. If somebody blows you away, blows you away, you hire them. In a lot of ways, that's how Nick got the job. If not, you say, you go back and you say, you know what? We talked to everybody. Look at all these guys we talked to. And then you hire Denard Wilson and you run what you want to run. And it mm -hmm. sort of works both ways from that standpoint. I'd like Wilson to sigh odds if I'm placing odds more than the bench Josephs or, or, or one of the college coordinators. Yeah, I agree. I think they're more likely to internally promote Denard or like, yeah, bring in Desai and kind of keep the language the same and say, we have 11 guys who are really good. Let's kind of let them run what they know and play fast. The one of the reasons why I like bringing in different dudes, you bring in college guys, right? It brought up Jim Leonard, Jesse Minter uh, from Michigan as well. And Vance Joseph is because, this Vic Fangio inspired defense It's been around for a bit now, right? It's made yeah. the rounds. Yeah. yeah. And accordingly offenses have started to figure out, okay, this is what we want to get against this look. 
This is what like all right, this is their philosophy. We're going to take away the pass, the expensive stop, and the run. Here's how we're going to get them into good run looks. And then we're just going to run the football. We're going to do it this way. All right, if they want to play, you know, and drop this safety down. Here's where we're going to run our over routes. Like you know, they they, they start to to find the weak points, the, the 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 gaps in the armor. So then when you bring in like a Sean Desai for an example, uh, Desai's had opportunity to. to coordinate and, and affect multiple defenses now over the past few years in Chicago and in Seattle, those defenses lost to the same stuff. Like those defenses were soft against the run and, and, and would lose to heavy personnel run teams, you know, uh, regularly, right. Uh, consistently. And so you start to wonder like, all right, does Desai have like the, the, the exact answer, like the very tricky, very specific answer to this one problem. Cause if he doesn't, and everybody knows he doesn't, then I'm not sure I want to like, all right, let's keep the, the language the same. Let's keep the philosophy the same. But I don't have a, a, a creative guy in this in this scheme tree. I don't have like a, one of the generators of this family. I just have one of the offshoots. I have one of the branches who's just like, he's going to run the stuff that Vic taught him. He's going to run the stuff that Staley taught him. But when he's challenged with something new, he doesn't have a solution for it. Like a lot of being a good defensive coordinator, specifically the defensive side of the ball, is being able to solve one week problems. Okay, like we're going to show them X. They're going to be X with Y. How do I get to Z? And that's when like just getting guys off the trees, getting branches can get tricky. And that's why you bring in a Vance Joseph and a yeah. Jesse Minter and you put it on the board and you go, okay, here's the problem. How would you solve this? And you start to get different ideas from different guys because you want a defense coordinator, a generator. You want a guy who can solve problems, create solutions on a one week basis. That's why Spags is so good for the Chiefs. From week one to week 13, their defense doesn't do anything. They just try stuff. Like what if we sent this guy? What if he's in coverage? Can we do this with him? Let's let all these rookies play. And then by the time you get to December, January football, they've got a lot of arrows in their quiver. They got a lot of tools in their bag and they can solve problems. And so that's why, like, I'm, o- I'm always careful about hiring the offshoot of the offshoot of the coaching. I said, I bet Ben, I love that is my biggest criticism of Jonathan mm-hmm. Gannon. People say I defend him too much. I always get a, I, Jody will tell you this. I don't want the guy. I don't want the copycat. I want the innovator and, mm-hmm. and Vic. By the way, it goes to Miami. His first press conference is, you know, everybody's playing my deal. I don't like that, you know, <laughs> because everybody gets you. We've been through this with Tony Dungy. We've been through this with Pete Carroll. We've been through this with Zimmer, with the A-gap stuff. Eventually, people catch up. I think they've already caught up to this scheme. Am I wrong, yeah. or or is it still in, yeah, in that phase? What what? This defense, like when we say the Fangio defense, what we're what we're really talking about is the the 2020 season for the Rams when Brandon Staley became the defensive coordinator and like literally, literally just took a dude out of the box and put him at safety and was like, We're gonna do this forever. And offenses for a whole year were like, What? You can't no, like it was just there was just one more body back and one yeah. less body in the box to yeah. defend the run than there typically was against all like it was just minus one, minus one, minus one. And that was a, a philosophy shift. It wasn't so much a scheme shift. It is to a degree, but it's more so a philosophy shift. And that's why, like, when Vic says, like, everybody's running my stuff, I don't like that everybody's running my stuff. He's right because a lot of the league has gone, okay, we need to take this extra player out of the box. We need to have that extra body against the pass. Vic Fangio and Brandon Staley did this. Let's run their stuff. And the reality is that what, what's important is the philosophy shift. What's important is, is just the change of perspective. And that's why, like, Gannon didn't come from the, the Fangio-Staley tree. But his defenses were extremely influenced by that tree because when he took the job in Philadelphia, he said, I'm going to be light in the box. I'm going to find a way to get an extra body against the pass. It's the philosophy shift that's valuable. So we're going to stop the pass at the expense of stopping the run. So when you interview Jesse Minter, one of your first questions is, hey, where's the extra? Are you going to take the guy out of the box? Stop the pass at the expense of stopping the run? So if he comes in, he's like, we're going to have a guy for every gap and we're going to stop the run and the battle's one of the trenches just not where football is right now you you have yeah. to be able to, to understand philosophically yeah. stop the past expense stop the run so the philosophy effect of fangio and gannon or fangio and staley excuse me very very good very valuable you want to keep hunting that schematically you don't need to like run oh vic fangio calls this you know cover eight so we're running cover eight because it's what vic runs like we don't need that we need the philosophy that's the important thing in your next defense coordinator all right. Speaking of philosophy, and you just made me think of this, and uh, I appreciate you doing that because I was going to bring it up at some point on the show today. Um, the way the Philadelphia Eagles and the Kansas City Chief prepared for the year. Now, I know Andy Reid in 2022 is not Andy Reid 1999 because I was here in Philadelphia in 1999 when he had his first camp ever. 
the game has changed. The National Football League has changed. Even the way Andy preps for a season has changed. But he's still as old school as anybody else in the league. If you're only comping him to the other 31 teams, he puts more time and effort into practice. He works them a little bit harder in preseason, certainly harder than the Philadelphia Eagles do, who want, run one of the most lax uh, preparations in the National Football League to get ready for a season. Now, I had to give the Eagles a ton of credit because I questioned it and go, hey, what happened to practice makes perfect? They, they got upwards of an hour and a half. They're done in 35 minutes. What the hell? Hey, get them off. Get them in the, let them Let them rest. But it worked for the Eagles. They were healthy for the Super Bowl. But again, bottom line is the last team standing was the Kansas City Chiefs. And mm -hmm. they put in more prep time than almost anybody else in the National Football League compared to a team that puts in maybe less press time, uh, prep time than anybody else in the National Football League. And my grasping at straws here, did that have nothing to do with the outcome of the Super Bowl? Or can the Chiefs kind of uh, bang their chest? Go, see, our way works. Uh, practice right. does make perfect. The Eagles play the Chiefs in week one this upcoming season. I think it'll matter. It matters in that sort of a game in September a lot more than it matters in a February game. I think by February, you know who you are as a team. You've taken a lot of hits. You've done a lot of tackling. You're up where you're supposed to be in terms of physicality. You've made your mistakes. You've installed your stuff. You've changed your stuff. You're all right. I think you see a lot of the, the, the teams that relax and don't do as much physical stuff in, in August, right, who, who've ramped – practice times down or, you know, a ramped shell days down. Like, I think you see those teams. Yeah. They'll come out the gate slow in week one. They might have an embarrassing week one loss. Think about bills against Steelers a couple years ago, Packers against saints a couple years ago, right? Just dead out the gate. But by the end of September, I think you're all right. I think you, you, you remember what football feels like and you're okay. By the time you get to February, I think it's negligible. And like you bring up <laughs> Eagles were unbelievably healthy over the course yeah, of the season. Yeah. And if, and the, edge that you lose in terms of like not having great preparation and, 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 and be and stumbling out the gate week one and week two, in my opinion is less than the edge you gain. If you're getting one more starter healthy for a playoff run than you would otherwise just one to me is, is more meaningful. So I don't know just how like strong that, that correlation is health is a very tricky thing to try to predict and, and, and plan for in the NFL. So I'm not going to go and say, Oh, the Eagles are healthy this year. That means all their practice schedules were correct. I think that's still a moving target. But to me, like a February game isn't impacted too much by how much you're practicing in August relative to like the early season games. I uh, want to circle back to where we started, Ben, and you mentioned Jalen Hurts and the uniqueness of the constant improvement mm -hmm. year after year after year after year, which we typically don't see uh, with quarterbacks. You have lulls, you have valleys, you have peaks. Um, he's been pretty consistent uh, uh, with the upward trend. Um, a lot of that, I think, relates to his work ethic, his willingness to try to improve. A lot of that is player development. I, I often think about 1999 and that draft and Donovan McNabb coming with Andy Reid. What if some of those other guys got with Andy Reid and Donovan McNabb had to go to Cleveland or you know some disastrous organization at the time? Play, I think player development is real is what I'm saying. Um, the Eagles had one heck of a supporting cast. You've done a lot of quarterback evaluation, as I mentioned. What What is the ceiling of this player? Can it go higher? Because the ceiling, if this is the ceiling, it's pretty good. I mean, I think you're pretty good with this. Can it go yeah. higher? If he can continue to make throws like the ones he made in the second half of the Super Bowl, yeah. Like, Hurts, in terms of making challenging throws into like tight windows this year. He didn't really have to do it too much. They do it down the field a lot, right? He'll just take a one-on-one -on -one shot to AJ Brown, take a one-on-one -on -one shot to Devonte Smith and be like, Hey, you're covered, but you're like really good. So just go make this catch. Like there's those tight window throws. And then there's, I can see half of Dallas Goddard. Let me put this ball up, you know, above the rim where only he can go get it. And he does like the, like those, like the crossing patterns and the patterns into the sideline. Like those are as big boy of throws as you can get. Uh, so to me, like that's an area where Hertz is really accurate downfield. He was less so accurate after the shoulder injury, but over the course of the season, really accurate vertical thrower down the field. Stuff that crosses his eyes left to right horizontal is stuff where he's not as accurate, but like the, the throws he was making in the, uh, in the, the Super Bowl there were impressive. And so that's the spot where you can get better. Uh, he continues to like not be the most comfortable guy in the pocket, right? He'll leave a pocket earlier than he should because he just trusts his legs so much. I don't know if that 
is even something you improve. Like I, 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 I struggle to fault him for it because he's so good out of the pocket. He's such a good yeah. runner when he talks to the football such that you don't want to discourage him from leaving when he feels like he should leave. But he can kind of calibrate that. It's something you saw Mahomes do, right? 2019-2020 Mahomes left a lot more pockets a lot quicker than 2022 Mahomes did. Didn't negate or, or in any way uh, you know pull from his efficiency at all. It just was maturation of a quarterback finding check downs, working within the scope of the offense. And so there's little stuff that absolutely hurts can get better on. I think that raises the ceiling a bit in general. I think this is about where you're going to see hurts be like, I think hurts right now isn't on the list of the top five quarterbacks in the league, but he's knocking on the door. And I think that that that'll be right around where he cycles over the course of his career. Right. will be okay. He's probably not in Mahomes, He's not an Allen. He's not like the elite alien how did this guy become a human being tier, but he's around that next tier. And it's just a matter of like settling into in what slot he is. So to me, like that's, you know, that's a playoffs every season, always have a chance to a Super Bowl sort of a ceiling. And yeah, he's almost there. Jalen's alien traits are on fourth down and one. And they got to change the rule on him yet. But still nobody can push the pile, even without help. Eagles are still going to convert a whole bunch of fourth and ones next year without the tush push. All right. Last thing for you. And if you have uh, already done this research, please share. If not, if this is a preemptive question, I'll apologize for it. Eagles have to upgrade their third wide receiver. We got no problems with Devonta. We got no problems with AJ. Quez Watkins dropped a bunch of balls this year. Didn't fight for balls against Dallas. Let Dallas into side. We all know the knocks on Quez. How about a philosophy switch at that position? Rather than a guy we know what Quez's strong suit is, he can fly. And he's going to get up open over the top. And two or three times a year, you're going to connect on a 60-yard touchdown. It's going to be great. But then there's every other play. Maybe a more like a Danny Amendola guy. Give me a smaller guy who's going to make the catch on third and seven for eight and fall down and get the first down. Doesn't have to be big play. Doesn't have to be over the top but just somebody who can catch the football and maybe I'm overreacting to Quez dropping the football, but give me a possession receiver in the slot rather than a, you were going to hit him long type receiver, a good philosophy and B is there a free agent out there that would fill that void for the Eagles? Yeah. I like the idea of a possession receiver as their third receiver. I think you can keep speed as like wide receiver four and wide receiver five, get him on the field occasionally, but he doesn't need to be your third receiver. I would say that instead of going small, they'll go big. Right. Like think okay. about Zach, Zach Pascal, right. Where like, yeah, uh, Pascal, like Stoutland, when Stoutland talks about Pascal, he's like, this is one of the best non offensive line blockers I've ever seen. Right. And that player is really valuable in terms of the Eagles RPO game, right. Run fast option, just their general run game. Right. You go 11 personnel, three receivers on the field, but Zach Pascal is that third receiver. You have an additional blocker that really adds a layer to the running game. You send this guy in motion, make him a lead blocker for Jalen Hurts. Like I think if they go for a possession receiver, they'll go for a bigger body. Alan Lazard is a sort of a free agent that makes sense for that. Jacoby Myers can do that. I think they'll get outpriced from Myers, right? I think Myers will be, you know, too big on the free agent market. Uh, Juju Smith Schuster is around. Juju doesn't block as well as he used to, though, because he's gotten banged up a lot. So he's not nearly the physical player he was. Robert Woods got cut by the Titans. That was long time his role with uh, with uh, the Los Angeles Rams. That's the sort of dude that I'd imagine they look for. I don't think they'll go. Yeah, they undersized. wanted Robert Woods yeah. before he went to Tennessee. Then. Yeah. yeah. So I'd be surprised if they go undersized, like the Amendola mold, like you said. I think they, they're more likely to go for a bigger mold. They'll keep speed on the, on the roster for sure, though. So even if they get, like, they let Pascal walk and they improve on him with, like, you know, Robert Woods. The, Quez will still be on the roster and he'll still probably like be wide receiver three. It's just Woods will have a, a, a family of snaps on early downs when they want to involve him in the, in the blocking game, in the run game. And then Quez will have a family of snaps on later downs when they just want to stretch the field, make more room for AJ, make more room for Devontae. Uh, bigger issue at Benjamin Solak. Uh, read uh, Ben at the ringer.com. Uh, does a tremendous job with our buddy Shield Kapadia on the Philly special podcast. Um, you know, last year, one of the underreported parts, I think of the Eagles success was the continuity on the coaching staff. We're at four and counting. Now, both coordinators are gone. Nick Rollis is gone. Uh, the Eagles thought he was a future defensive coordinator was right. <laughs> He's already a defensive yeah. coordinator at 29. Joe Casper, a little bit lesser, but he's gone. Um, Continuity of the coaching staff versus all the free agents. Bigger problem for the Eagles moving forward. I think it's all the free agents. 
uh, it's not to diminish the value of the coaching. Like losing both their coordinators is tough. Uh, and the Eagles have done a nice job, I think, over the course of just like Lurie's ownership of developing coaches in the building, let alone what we've kind of seen from Nick Sirianni and, and kind of wondering what it would be like in his first moment now where he's got to replace some coordinators. I think in general, they have a good philosophy there. It is a big deal. I don't want to diminish it at all. But Javon Hargrave plus James Bradbury plus Josh Gardner Johnson plus TJ Edwards plus Miles Sanders plus Isaiah Mall, it's a lot. I think it's got a, they're a really talented team. Uh, and a lot of these dudes are approaching free agency. They're not going to be able to bring them all back. Cap's going up, but it ain't going up like that. Uh, and, and this is a team, like I said, they lined up and played on defense and they lined up and played on offense. I mean, they walked out on offense, ran a college offense, just dominated NFL defense. Yeah. Like, they were so, yeah. so, so talented. Such People that, get uh, mad at me, Ben, uh, yeah. when I tell them how simple the Eagles offense is. Tell them the Eagles. Offense it's is freaking it's simple. not a slight. It's a compliment. <laughs> no, right? I know. Everybody else got to yeah. do like 10,000 things on the chalkboard. Yeah. Like, Coaches in the room at 2 a.m. living on Red Bull trying to figure yeah. out a way to get an explosive passing play. And the Eagles are just like, what if we just throw it to AJ? Could we do that? That'd be good. That'll work. <laughs> like it's, it, it, keep it simple, stupid. They yeah. went and got uh, they got a quarterback who puts a unique stress on a defense. They play 11 on 11 so they can run the football. Uh, they went and they got receivers that can win against man coverage so that that way when you have to put that extra player in the box to get man coverage on the outside, they'll win with that. And then they got a, a play caller in Shane Steichen. And this is where I really think their losses might hurt them. They got a playing caller in Shane Steichen, who's just like a, he was like a boxer with feel, man. He was like yeah, a pitcher man. with like a sense on the mound. You just had a just, great description. He is a he's, great play caller. Always just knew, like he, he just would hit you with, with the same little run, the same little run, the same little run. And then the moment you as a defensive coordinator adjusted, he was already there with the counter. Like he just, he could feel when a guy was, was, was ready to counter and he would just be one step ahead just a wonderful like sequential play caller just understood the game. And I'll be curious to see how they replace that because 2021 Nick Sirianni gives up play calling Shane Sykin gets it. And and that was the first spark for this offense. That was the first yeah. like, Oh, we got yeah. something here with Jalen hurts. And so uh, Steichen, I think is, is a really big loss in that regard, but in general, yeah, if you can be simple and just line up and play and, and consistently score 30, why would you do anything else? It, 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 it's a testament to how well the roster is built and a testament to the coaching staff, understanding the players that they've got. So Love their simple offense. It's awesome. It's impressive. Um, but they, yeah, they, they're going to lose some of that talent. It's going to make things more challenging moving forward. And it may next year be necessary that they get a little bit more creative yeah. because uh, not all of the same uh, pieces are going to be in place. All right, last thing for me, and it's a completely unfair question. I love asking unfair questions. Got to do it. Hypothetical look into your crystal ball. The starting quarterback across from Darius Slay next year on the Philadelphia Eagles will be one of four things. The return of James Bradbury, the elevation of someone on the roster as Zach Mack, maybe. Mm -hmm. Another veteran coming in free agent or trade, maybe how he makes a trade, but for a lesser salary than a Bradbury's going to get on the open market or a draft pick. Someone that how we will pick in April for potentials. Uh, Bradbury stays, Eagles elevate, they go find somebody else, free agent or trade, or they draft a replacement. Put them in order for me. Most likely to be starting across from Slay next year. One is draft a replacement. I'm, I feel pretty strongly about that. The, the biggest weakness of this Eagles team that was never exploited or talked about was they had two corners, outside corners over 30, with no depth. None. Like Avante Maddox. Zach maybe, Mack, you're not a big Zach Mack fan? Nah, mm -hmm. I mean like I think they'll give him a shot to, to win it. I haven't seen anything from McPherson and his like very limited reps that makes you think, oh, this guy's really figuring it out. McPherson's also like, he's tall, but he's not like the longest dude. Maddox is short. He's not <laughs> the longest dude. Like they, they were living with two 30 plus guys in yeah, outside corner yeah. with nothing proven behind them. And Slay and Bradbury never missed time. And that was like living on a razor's edge. Uh, I definitely think they draft a guy. This corner class is nuts. Good. I love like at, at, at uh, 10 and at 31, you have, or excuse me, at 30, 30 you have really, yeah. really, really nice picks. Uh, and so I imagine draft the guy's top two, I would say is, is the veteran trade and replacement, right? The pick up a guy like, you know, the, the Steven Nelson, Ronald Darby, James Bradbury approach. Like this is just what, how he does. They're going to cycle in veteran corners and, and see if they get lucky on a guy. And when you do like, like with Bradbury, Bradbury had a rough season in 2021, played so much better in 2022. You just see how much it helps your team. Uh, I would say three is bring Bradbury back and see what his price tag looks like, see what he's a free agency. I would say four is internally promote just because if they're internally promoting, 
they're so like they're already thin when it was Slay, Bradbury, and then McPherson. Yeah. If you are just promoting McPherson, you got less than nobody behind him. And I imagine yeah. they've drafted somebody. <laughs> Remember, and that's beat out the, Mac. Yeah, Ben last off season before obviously they got James, and it was clear Stephen Nelson wasn't going to be back. You heard. Ah, we love Zach McPherson. We love Tay Gowan. We love Carrie Benson Jr. Big, big Josh uh, Joby guy. Just loving yeah, it. It's Josh great, man. Uh, yeah, I think Tay is on the Vikings practice squad. I think Carrie Benson Jr. is in the XFL. So that oh, worked oh, out. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, they uh, they yeah. like to do the carousel at corner. And again, when you hit, you hit. And it's nice. Um, but I, I've i watched this entire cornerback class. There's like seven dudes that are round one players. It's bananas. It's as good as I can remember. They got to get somebody. If they walk yeah. out of round one without a corner, I'll go ballistic. Then we will get you back up to talk about potential draftees at all positions. And Eagles offseason did a great job for us today. Thank you very much. We will be reaching out to get you back on the show soon enough. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, John. Appreciate y'all. Our Thanks, pleasure. Man. Ben Solak from The Ringer and his, you got to check out his Philly podcast. They call it uh, creatively the Philly special. He is Philly Gioca special, Potty. baby. Yeah, Ben knows his stuff, man. Ben he does his stuff. He he's, is uh, uh, he very knows good. Scheme I... and and uh, you know he's great evaluating quarterbacks and uh, but yeah, Gannon Gannon wanted to run the Fangio defense year one, but you can't do it with Jannard Avery and Javon Parkray playing nose tech. No, you you and to Howie's credit, the he got through to Howie and said, "Let's here's what I need. If I'm gonna run the defense, I want to run. Here's where you need to give me ta different talent upgrade." 